Uh, welcome to the connected car. Uh, this is the only demo at the conference that I'm aware of that we actually have the risk of property damage, bodily harm, even death. Um, because we are actually going to be doing a live demo in case you guys saw a second ago. We actually have a team across town uh, that are going to be doing a, some driving. We're actually going to do a live demonstration of the connected car uh, application for you guys. Um, my name is Michael Manella. I'm the project lead of Spring Batch. I also contribute to a number of other Spring portfolio projects, Spring Cloud and whatnot. Um, these are the other two speakers, uh, Phil Berman and Derek Shields. Those are the guys in the car. I'll let them actually introduce themselves uh, when we get to their part. Please ask questions. Uh, I want to make sure you guys get everything you want out of this session. And it's just more interesting to have a dialogue instead of me talk at you for 90 minutes. Unlike last year, all of the code this year is available on GitHub. So go ahead and the slides will be available along with all the other slides. Um, but all of this code that we're going to be demoing today is available on GitHub. Check it out. So where did this come from? Where did this uh, demo application come from? Uh, if we take a step back, we had a really cool IoT project. It had lots of clients out in the field. They were relatively unconnected. We connected them. Lots of data, high-speed uh, ingestion, data science, cool dashboards, all the things that I would love to stand up here and tell you about. The problem is we have an NDA that I can't say a word about. So we got to thinking, what could we do that uses the same pieces, the same general architecture, and apply it to something that just about everybody would understand, which is where we came up with the connected car. So we figure everybody either has a car, been in a car, knows what a car is. Um, so with the connected car piece, we add on two pieces of functionality. Specifically, we predict the destination, so where are you going? And then based on where you're going, we predict how, much, how far you can get or the range of your car. If you have a modern car, you probably see a range prediction or a range value within your car right now. That's a really dumb uh, value. It basically takes the current miles per gallon and multiplies it out till you run out of gas, based on how much gas is left in the tank. The problem with that, though, is as you transition from like city driving to highway driving and back, traffic conditions, all those types of things, none of that is taken into account in that calculation. So our version actually takes where you're going and the, the historical traffic patterns into account in that prediction. Does that make sense? Like I said, all the pieces are essentially the same. So the ingestion pieces, the high-speed data, multiple clients, all that type of thing, we're using uh, the same data stores for the back end. We've got an HTML dashboard. So all of those pieces from that NDA project apply exactly the way they did here. Before we get into the connected car, though, from a functionality perspective, let's talk a little bit about IoT in general. Um, when, we talk about, when we think about IoT, a lot of people will think about um, the humorous aspects of things like tweeting toilets and uh, refrigerators that have CNN feeds in little uh, windows on them. The problem with that is that's not the real goal of IoT. The goal of IoT is really about operational efficiencies. It's about improving how things are done to impact either personal lives, uh, corporate profits, the whole nine yards. I've got a quick video that illustrates some examples of that that I'd like to share. My mom, she makes underwater fans that are powered by the moon. My mom makes airplane engines that can talk. My mom makes hospitals you can hold in your hand. My mom can print amazing things right from her computer. My mom makes trains that are friends with trees. My mom works at GE. So full disclosure, GE is a, uh, uh, one of the uh, original funders of Pivotal. Um, so that they are part of our owners. Um, but that highlights in a uh, fant fantastical way uh, some of the IoT things that people are working on. Uh, the, abil the ability to improve maintenance uh, routines for jet engines based on 
based on sensor data, um, improving healthcare by, by improved IoT related solutions. These are the types of operational efficiencies we're talking about. And typically when we get to the, those types of efficiencies, we're talking about 1%. How can we improve this process by 1%? In most cases, that isn't that big of a deal, right? If I improve the, uh, my electric bill by 1%, that probably isn't that big of a deal, unless you've got a really bad electric bill. Um, but in larger scales, in the industrial internet, or even in the connected car space, where you're talking about millions of cars or even billions of cars on the road, 1% becomes a big deal. Worldwide right now, there's, or actually in 2010, so about five years ago for these numbers, um, there, are, there were 1 billion cars on the road worldwide. Fast forward, 20, 25 years, there will be 2 billion cars on the road. To keep those cars moving, we need to consume 120 million barrels of crude oil a day at a price, current price of about $5.4 billion a day in oil. And that cranks out 51.6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. If we saved 1% of that from a carbon, carbon dioxide perspective, That'd be the equivalent of Russia not creating a single ounce of carbon this year. And they're the fourth largest producer of carbon dioxide on the planet. So 1% at that scale becomes a big deal. So with the connected car, let's talk a little about IoT architectures. If you're familiar with IoT architectures, you might have seen a diagram like this before. Essentially, there's a loop going on that, that uh, you participate in. It starts off, it starts off at the edge. The edge is essentially your device, it's the thing. So it's the nest in your home, it's the car in this case, it's the jet engine, et cetera. From the edge, the edge processes, or, uh, provides data to an ingest point that ingests the data into a system. On that system then, there's, you do both processing and analysis. So processing may be data transformation, those types of things. And analysis is things like data science, predictive analytics, those types of things. Those are both working with data storage at, at the bottom end. And then they also feed into applications at the top end. So dashboards, uh, feedback, which is the React piece of this, feeding back into the initial uh, device or initial processes to allow that improvement to happen. If we take a look at this from a uh, actual technical components piece for today, the edge is obviously the car. Um, ingest, process, and analyze are all developed with pieces from the Spring portfolio, heavily Spring Cloud. So we'll be looking at the code in a bit. Um, the storage pieces we're using are HDFS, or uh, Pivotal HD. We're using Gemfire to power our dashboard. And we're using Redis to store our models for the data science piece on Cloud Foundry. All this is running on Cloud Foundry. And our application is uh, an HTML5 uh, Angular-based application. Does that make sense? I could spend even more time digging in and trying to describe the functionality, but it's a whole lot easier for me just to show you guys. So with that, let's go ahead and actually dig into the various pieces of this. Let's start off actually on Cloud Foundry. Um, this morning I pushed, so this is the Cloud Foundry app manager. This is where you can see the applications that are deployed on Cloud Foundry as well as the services. So for our application, we have nine total applications. There are seven, microservices that are used for ingestion, there's a RESTful API, and then the dashboard itself. You can see all these are already running. And then we have two service instances. We have a bus that our microservices will communicate across. That's Redis in this case. And then we have Gemfire, which is going to power our dashboard. We'll get to that. <laughs> the question was, is there no XD 2.0 yet? Uh, and we'll get to what exactly is on what exactly these apps are. So that's what's that's the piece that's already been deployed that's running right now. Let's go ahead and transition to the team in the car. I introduce Hello, I introduce Phil Berman. And, okay? We can hear you fine. Excellent. My name is Philip Berman. I'm a field engineer based in Chicago. And I'm Derek Shields. I'm a field engineer based right out of here in this glorious city of D.C. So um, what we'd like to start with is a description of the technology we've got going in the car. First, we have this dongle uh, from GoPoint Technologies. 
It's going to be plugged into the OBD2 port in the car. Um, Derek, why don't you go ahead and plug this into the OBD2 port? All right. Nicely done. That's plugged in. We got a flashing blue Bluetooth light. So OBD2 uh, uh, means onboard diagnostics. Every car since 1996 has an OBD2 port in it. Um, it reads sensor data from the engine. If you've ever had an engine light, you know, that your engine's overheating or there's something wrong with the engine, or perhaps you have uh, brought your car into the emissions testing, that's where they plug that in. Um, now the next piece of the puzzle, we have um, an app. Yeah, hey, you wanna go ahead and start the car here? Oh, uh, give it a go. Car is started, that's always a good sign. Here we have, uh, you can see here, uh, a P that's an app developed by Pivotal Labs. I'm actually wearing a t-shirt from the Chicago Pivotal Labs. A big shout out to my friends from Pivotal in Chicago. Um, we're gonna start this app. The name of this app is called Herbie. And the job of Herbie is to connect via Bluetooth to, um, oh, there's the, there's the beep of Bluetooth, which we were waiting at. Uh, I don't know if you can hear that uh, back there. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is, we're starting this up. He's entering the bin right now. The way we do this currently is we actually enter the bin because not all vehicles right now always report their bin properly. So he's actually entering one. All right, we're gonna start this thing up. And uh, before we confirm that we have data, well, Michael, do you see any data? The suspense builds. So while Michael's doing that, uh, the, the plan here is to see if machine learning can predict where we're actually going to drive. So um, we're about to get started. Michael, how are we doing for the dashboard? Uh, I do not. Hey, Michael, we don't have data on our end. Okay, well, I can only do so much. <laughs> yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to restart this. So, un unfortunately, Phil decided to go with the uh, iPhone instead of the Android. As <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong, right? You want me to uh, recycle the... Now, let's see if we got it. There oh, we, go. we got you now. We got you now. All right. So to prove this is real time, uh, let's have them rev up the engine. Who wants uh, 1,000 RPMs? Who wants 2,000 RPMs? Who wants 3,000 RPMs? I guess How about 4,000? <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to blow up the rental car? <laughs> let's go for 4,000. 4,000? All right, here we go. So you can see the dashboard's refreshing, real time. Is it working? Yep. Yeah, yep. All right. Cool. All right. So are you guys going to get going then? All right. We're going to start driving. Uh, we can check back in periodically and we'll see how, uh, you know, how we're going. Okay. Hey, Phil, flip, flip your... Uh... Oh, that's right. Oh, I forgot to mention, so, we are at the Watergate Hotel. That's our starting location. This view allows us to see when they do hit somebody as opposed to... <laughs> okay, so, uh, Phil, you want to go ahead and mute yourself? Sure. Cool, thanks. So while they're driving around, let's go ahead and walk through the dashboard itself. Uh, so this is the dashboard. Uh, you can see that it's based on... It, we've got a map here that we can zoom in and see exactly where they're at as they're driving. Uh, we can see their speed, RPMs, the coolant temperature, and the fuel level. So these are all uh, real-time uh, ingested pieces of data. The more interesting view, in my opinion, is actually this view. This view is a blown out view that allows us to see all of the potential journeys that they could be going to. So historically, where have they been? And 
each one of these points identifies where they've been, and that's where we are predicting between where they could be going. Along the right, we've got miles per gallon. So if you've ever paid attention in your car, the miles per gallon, that little indicator that you'll see, you'll see wide swings from zero to crazy, ridiculous numbers. Because it's instantaneous miles per gallon, that's what we're displaying here. So even though we're driving a, a Ford uh, Explorer, you could, if they're on the highway and take their foot off the gas going 60 miles an hour, it'll compute that it's going to do you know, 80 or 90 miles per gallon, which we all know isn't true. Below that is the predicted range. And that's what we believe the car can go based on the journey that we are currently predicting them to be on, which takes us to this next part. This is a list of each one of the potential journeys they're on. We show where they're going, the probability at that instant that we believe that that is the correct journey they're on, and then the latitude and longitude of their endpoint. So in this case, right now, they should be bouncing relatively evenly across all of them. Yeah, right now they sh they're relatively evenly bouncing between them. One should drop off relatively quick, which is what I'm kind of waiting for. Yeah, we're just uh, passing where we sometimes go to Georgetown. Uh, it's one of our frequent locations. So you can see they just passed off the point of no return on that, and you'll see the Georgetown number continue to drop. It's pulled right now. So the question was, is it web sockets? It's pulling right now. So any questions about the functionality before we get into how it works? Cool. So how does this work? We'll start off in the car. Um, like Phil said, we're using uh, the OBD2 port or onboard diagnostics port that's available in every car manufactured since 1996. Um, it provides a collection of different data. It has static values like VIN and model and make and those types of things, engine type. It has dynamic values that we're actually reading off of, so current RPM, current speed, and so forth. It also has uh, uh, kind of a, a, a blend between the two, and those are the trouble codes that if you take your car in with the check engine light, that the, main, that the mechanic is going to pull off. Um, I don't have the, my GoPoint dongle, but I do have one of the ones we used initially as a, uh, to develop a prototype with. So I'll go ahead and pass it around so you guys can take a look at it. This is an example of an OBD2 request and response. Um, unfortunately, with mo actually most IoT-related solutions, the APIs you're dealing with are very low level. There aren't these nice restful endpoints that I can just hit and get nicely formatted JSON back. Instead, I'm dealing with hex via TCP sockets. Um, so this is an example of a request response. The yellow is the request. So the request is broken up into two pieces. The first one is the mode which indicates essentially which bucket of data I'm looking for. So mode one is the real-time stuff. Mode nine is the static stuff. I think mode five is the stuff that's the trouble codes. Um, so what bucket of data am I looking for? And then the next part, the zero D, is the hex value of the parameter ID that I'm asking for. So what is the actual data point I'm, ask, I'm looking for? So in this case, zero one zero D is asking for the, the current speed. So I'm asking the car how fast you go. The rest of this is the response you get back. So the first line, it, it starts off by echoing back exactly what you sent. From the one on the, on the second line all the way through the four, this is a collection of different flags indicating caching and whatnot that you can set when you initialize your connection. Um, I don't want to go through all of them. Then the orange piece is really the actual response. That's the meat of the, the actual data that we care about. So 10D, again, the mode in the PID I requested. So it's saying it back again. And then 30 is the current value for speed in kilometers per hour in hex. So 30 in hex is 48 kilometers an hour. And conveniently, since I'm an American, four, or 48 miles per hour converts back to 30 miles an hour. Does that make sense? 
obviously cars aren't connected. They don't have, most of them don't have some type of internet connection back, so we need to provide that. We're doing that via the phone. Uh, so the phone app provides connectivity. It also enriches the data for us. The OBD2 standard doesn't provide things like GPS, uh, acceleration. Uh, so those are things that we're adding via the phone application. Here's an example of the JSON. I'm not, I don't expect you guys to be able to read that. Don't even try. Uh, I'm just, it's there so that when you guys get the slides, you'll be able to see it. Um, but it has a collection of fields, uh, everything from the OBD2 standard we're actually getting, uh, latitude, longitude, VIN, bearing, uh, and more analytics, analytical stuff like the catalyt, catalyst, catalytic converter, temperature, uh, mass airflow sensor readings, current fuel levels, and so forth. The communication between these, so it's a TCP socket over Bluetooth from the phone to the dongle. And then we're doing HTTP posts from the phone to the server. Let's go ahead and take a quick look back at the dashboard and see where these guys are and see what our prediction is doing. So you can see they're driving along. Um, they, Georgetown has been rolled out. And I've got a hunch this one, uh, maybe not. It's still bouncing between them. So Georgetown is the only one that's been ruled out so far, although it looks like this guy is on his last legs. Um, but so about to uh, the turn off for the Biblical Labs office in Washington, D.C. Yeah, so that's the next one. Um, so we'll check in again later to see, uh, basically, as they travel their normal routes, where these drop off. Yeah, the, can I say something, Michael? Please do. The potential locations for this journey, we started at the Watergate Hotel, and we might be going to the Natural History Museum, or we might be going to the Pivotal Labs office, or we might be going to the World War II Memorial, or we might be going to Georgetown, or we might be going, oh, the Georgetown, we're going to the bistro there, right? Yeah. The French bistro where, yeah. where Derek met his bistro, wife. I'll say, yeah. And uh, uh, finally, we may be going to work, which would be at the Marriott Marquis is where we work. And I, I wonder where we may actually be going, uh, but we'll find out. None of those are a bar, I'm surprised. Bistro, bistro. Yeah, bistros are not bars. Okay, so on the server, um, we're running Cloud Foundry, like I said before. Um, we could have run this really anywhere. Uh, last year when we did this talk, we ran it on just a VM. Um, we're running this on Cloud Foundry, though, for three main reasons. Number one, it's easy. All I have to do to deploy my app is CF push, and I can get my applications up and running in the cloud production grade environment, literally that, that simply. Um, it also allows us, based on this architecture, to iterate on individual services very rapidly and in parallel. So I could have one team working on one service, another team working on another service, and plugging those in and out nice and easy. It's a mature platform. This is, this is something that's being used in production in a number of different enterprises for handling all kinds of different workloads. Uh, so it's a production-grade environment. One of the other key things, though, is we're not dependent on it. The applications we wrote, I can run them locally with java-jar, with, as long as I've got Redis running. And that would work just the same as if I did it in the cloud. So there's no, dependent, there's no dependence to us uh, on Cloud Foundry. So it be, provides a, uh, a great flexibility in where we run our applications. You asked specifically about no Spring, uh, Spring XD 2.0. So I don't want to steal too much thunder from the keynotes later, but um, Spring XD 2.0 is being re-architected. So Spring XD 1.0 uh, had a collection of containers, and then there was an admin container, and there was a bunch of different modules that got deployed in containers. XD 2.0 is more microservices. We're using that approach. Let's walk through that a little bit. If you think about data applications, they don't have to be IoT applications. They can be regular Spring integration or Spring batch applications. If you think about developing those as recently as two or three years ago, if you were going to develop them, it would probably would have been as a monolith, right? I would assemble a WAR file or a JAR file with Spring integration flows or Spring batch jobs and deploy that onto a server and run it there, right? That's kind of the way you would have developed that type of application. 
Um, like I said, those are the existing spring batch and spring integration applications. But we're going through a bit of an evolution. That evolution takes us, the next step of that evolution is data, data microservices. So we've been talking about microservices now for a year or two with regards to the web world. This brings that, those concepts to the data world. So now we're not talking about REST endpoints being called from an Angular dashboard. Now we're talking about actually plugging in microservices into an actual flow that can be, that can be orchestrated. What do these microservices mean or what are characteristics of them? Uh, number one, they're cloud native. So all of the cloud native things you would think of in a normal microservice, the configuration, service discovery, all those types of things, you would still apply those to these microservices. They're developed and tested in isolation. So I can independently develop uh, the HTTP source. I can independently de uh, develop the HDFS sync. I can independently develop each processor or transformer or the data science. Independently develop those, independently test them, independently deploy them so that I can be working in parallel. Apply all the microservice uh, patterns. Uh, if you went to the keynote last night, James Waters mentioned the 12 factor thing. That's basically what we're talking about here. And they're also operationally easier to govern. If you think about getting an application from the developer's laptop to production in most enterprise environments, that isn't a quick and easy, that's not as easy as CF push in most enterprise environments. There's QA, there's change control, there's ops, there's all these different steps of bureaucracy that stand between a developer writing code and it running live in production. One of the goals of these data microservices is to shrink down what each microservice contains so that moving through that bureaucracy or potentially even eliminating some levels of that, getting the code from the developer's laptop to production is a much easier uh, proposition. That's the second phase of the evolution. The third phase is Spring XD. We lay on top of that composition of microservices. So now instead of me doing CF push for each individual microservice, now I'm composing them via DSLs and saying HTTP, pipe, filter, pipe, uh, HDFS, and having the platform orchestrate those jar files for me and orchestrate those microservices for me. In common use cases, the goal is zero or as little as possible coding. So if I want to just pull tables from JDBC and push them to HDFS, I shouldn't have to rewrite that batch job over and over and over, right? I should just be able to have a module that does that for me. And then finally, operational and orchestrational coverage. So I need to be able to monitor my apps. I need to be able to uh, scale my apps. I need to be able to see what's down and have it recover gracefully. All these types of things are handled at the orchestration layer. Does that make sense? If we get down to actual brass tacks of how these things are packaged and pushed out, um, the first step of the uh, evolution, the monoliths, we're thinking typically wars and app servers, the traditional route. Um, for the second phase, we're thinking decomposing those into boot applications that you're pushing and orchestrating yourself. And then the third level is the Spring Cloud Streams, or I'm sorry, Spring Cloud Streams is that second level. Spring XD is the third level where you're working with the DSL and the shell and the UI and so forth. Does that make sense? If we look at this application, um, actually, let, before we get into that, let's see if anybody else has dropped off. Ooh, they're actually pretty close. So let's see. Hey, we're wondering uh, when you were going to come back. <laughs> well, that, that's my favorite part of the presentation, the new Spring XD 2.0 stuff. So you can see uh, with 100% certainty that we predicted that they're coming to the hotel. Surprise, surprise. Um, and based on that and based on how much gas is left in the tank, and the historic miles per gallon we've gotten on that journey, we predict he could go another 107 miles on the tank. So there's a lot of city driving in this case. Does that make sense? Let's see where they, they're not quite actually here yet. So we'll come back to them. So the from an application perspective, what does this look like actually running on Cloud Foundry? We've got a bus that it literally just has a bunch of Spring Boot applications that are hooked up to it. So I've got a source, I've got processors, I've got syncs. Uh, really, the only difference between those from a definition perspective is the source is writing to the bus, 
processors are reading and writing, and a sync is reading. Um, in our application, we're using Redis as the bus, so we have all these different applications that are hanging off of this. So HTTP, filter, transformer, Python, uh, HTFS, Gemfire, all of these are just basically hanging off our bus. If we look at it from a data flow perspective, we start off with the HTTP endpoint that we're ingesting the data from. We've passed that to a filter that basically drops all the packets that don't have complete data. There are certain fields that we need in order to do the prediction analysis. So basically, since we're getting data once a second, we just drop anything that doesn't have complete data, which is what happened in the beginning anyways. We were dropping everything because they weren't giving us anything. From there, we've got the transformer. The transformer in this case just adds a VIN and a time, or uppercase is the VIN for consistency and adds the timestamp. You could do anything you wanted within the transformer, that's just what we're doing. The Python piece is the actual data science piece. Um, that's where the actual data science magic of predicting where you're going and, how, and the miles per gallon per journey you get. I'll go into the actual code of these in just a second. After the Python piece, we're writing out to HDFS, so we're storing this into Hadoop so that we can actually uh, uh, generate our models in the future. And then we also are passing a copy onto a type transform, which really just changes the type so that we can store it in a Gemfire. Gemfire powers a REST API that actually feeds the dashboard. So this is the actual data flow of how the data is moving through our system. Does that make sense? Yeah. A spring. Correct, yes. So uh, there are nine apps total on running on Cloud Foundry. There should be nine squares on here. One, two, five, six, seven, yep. So the, the question was, uh, are we using XC right now? We are not. We are actually at the, the way that we deploy this right now is at that second level of, of the evolution. We're using the Spring, uh, uh, Spring Cloud Streams. We aren't using uh, Spring XD 2.0 yet. Um, they're actually going to be demoing that tonight uh, at the keynote, um, the actual orchestration pieces of that. So we're using the bleeding edge beta stuff, right? On the Spring Cloud Stream side of it, yes. So one, that actually brings up an interesting point. You can run your applications in either way. Spring XD 1.0, you write a custom module, you run it on Spring XD, right? This, I can write Spring Boot applications that are Spring Cloud Stream modules. I can orchestrate them myself. Or I can apply Spring XD on top of that and have Spring XD do the orchestration for me. I, it's, it's, it literally is an evolution. So I can develop these Spring Boot applications. Once the, my application is complex enough, whether not, once I've got those additional needs, then I can migrate seamlessly to Spring XD. Does that make sense? We're going to be getting into the code in just a second. Just to point out, all of the yellow are all of the things that we had to write, um, plus the dashboard. The HTTP, HDFS, Gemfire, those are out-of-the-box modules, so we didn't have to write those. Those are provided uh, as part of Spring, Spring Cloud Stream modules. So <laughs> essentially the modules for Spring Cloud Streams. Essentially, we're in the process of migrating all of the existing out-of-the-box Spring XD modules into that other repository. Since you asked for code. <laughs> Let's go ahead and actually take a look at what a Spring Cloud Stream module looks like. Actually, are they, oh, they're parked. So they'll be coming. Should we come in? Come on in. So quick show of hands, who came to this talk last year? OK. Uh, last year we had a, a, an interesting snafu in that somebody that he passed in the hall dropped an F-bomb. So uh, just be aware that this is live TV. So. <laughs> uh, so I'll walk through this, this code module by module um, so you can see uh, the pieces that we wrote. Again, this is all available out on GitHub. So I'll start off with the filter. The filter we're using is actually just a Groovy script. The, uh, there's an out-of-the-box module uh, called the Groovy Transformer, or 
I'm sorry, Groovy filter, which essentially takes a Groovy strip and uses that to evaluate each piece of data coming through. If the script returns true, it is allowed to pass on. If it's false, it's dropped. So all we're doing here is we're ingesting the JSON that we're getting from the phone, and then we're checking for the required fields we care about. So fuel level input, vehicle speed, mass airflow, which we use to compute the miles per gallon. And if that isn't there, we can actually still compute it based on RPM in, and intake temp and intake manifold pressure and knowing the size of the engine. So that's it for the filter piece. That's passed as a parameter to the uh, gem, or the Groovy filter module, so that's, there's no additional packaging that goes on here. The enrichment transformer is the first actual spring cloud streams, or yeah, spring cloud streams module. As you can see, it's nothing more than a boot application. Everybody's seen this type of code, right? Spring boot application, blah, blah, blah. Here's the code for the actual processing piece, and here's where the actual magic comes from. Enable binding. So enable binding is a new annotation within Spring Cloud Streams that essentially enables the binding of this application to the bus. So in this case, we're saying enable binding, and this is of type processor. So there's a, a source, a processor, and a sync uh, options for this. So a processor, if we take a look at it, it's going to do extend source and sync. So it has an input channel and an output channel. So by adding this, I get those channels for free, as well as all the binding that it takes to hook up to that. Then I'm just using straight spring integration to actually develop the code that I'm running here. So at transformer, this is just a spring integration transformer annotation. My input channel is processor.input, and my output channel is processor.output. So all of that orchestration piece is handled upstream from my code. And in this case, like I said, all I'm doing is I'm adding a timestamp, and if it has a VIN, I'm capitalizing it for, to normalize it for the data science down the way. Okay. Hey, uh, say hello, Austin. Oh, man. Hey guys, you guys are uh, you guys are losing the video. Yeah. So just, we'll see you. We just bye. <laughs> Unless anybody objects to that, I can call them back. <laughs> so does that make sense for the for the transformer? Moving along after the transformer was um, the Python stuff. The Python is the only thing that isn't actually. Um, uh, since it's not Java, it's actually Python. It's not a Spring Cloud Streams module, but because Spring Cloud Streams handles specific, um, they're trying to call back. <laughs> um, because that Spring Cloud Streams isn't, um, or Python isn't a Spring Cloud Streams module, it just follows the same paradigms that the regular modules do, and it can be put in in line with the other ones. So basically, as long as it knows the, the queue names to look for, you can just slot it into your, into your application with no problem. I'll dig into the data science piece of it later in the slides. I'm not a Python guy, so I don't want to dig into the code. Um, it is available all online for those that are really interested in that. Um, the next piece would be the actual transformer, or the Gemfire transformer. So in this case, we're using we're using Spring Data REST to serve up the data for the, for the dashboard. So in order to do that, we actually serialize the Java object into Gemfire. And so we need to take the JSON and convert that to uh, the Java object. So we create a transformer. Really simple, it is just enable binding processor again. And in this case, instead of uh, adding stuff, all we're doing is we are cleaning up You guys aren't on, by the way. You, the connection died, so I hung up on you. Yeah, I hung up on you. We ran into Austin on the way in. So I saw coming in. The director of the Pivotal Labs Chicago office is in the house. <laughs> so 
In this case, all we're doing is we're converting the JSON string into a Java object called car position. Um, here. That is what gets serialized into Gemfire, and that allows us to use Spring Data Gemfire uh, to just expose that as a REST service with no additional real code. The last piece of this from a Java perspective is the REST service, which is, again, as you'd probably imagine, pretty straightforward. So it's, again, it's a Spring Boot application. In the configuration, we have application configuration. All we're doing is we're doing enable Gemfire REST repositories. We're pointing our application to Gemfire. This gets all service binding magic uh, once it's pushed to Cloud Foundry. And then, oops, oh yeah, here. Oh, where was it? Where's the other annotation? Oh, sorry, because we're using that, we don't need it. Never mind. That's it for all the Java code. So as you can see, there isn't a lot of actual Java code in this application. Does it make sense, though? I purposely punted on the Python piece because I've got a collection of slides, so let's go through the, those. Uh, the data science piece. Um, it really breaks down into two different phases. Phase one is predict where you're going, and then based on that, and the miles per gallon historically for that journey, where, uh, what is your predicted range? It starts off by storing the data. We need historic data in order to predict where you're going. So basically, we need to know where you've been in order to know where you're going. We did, we, Based on that historic recorded data, we generate models in an offline batch mode. So that's one piece we didn't actually demo. The code is, again, available on GitHub. Um, but so what we do is we use Spark to analyze the data and develop clusters. So each one of those clusters is essentially um, representations of full journeys, so start point and end point. If you think about where you drive on a regular basis, you probably go to the same handful of places on a regular basis. Work, same grocery store, uh, maybe same bar, et cetera. Um, the batch processing is intended to identify what those clusters are so that we can then predict based on those options. If we take a look, this is a map, uh, I believe, of Berlin um, that our data science group used to actually test this out. So this is um, a wide view of a number of different journeys. They all started in the same spot up here. And then they each went, the, 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 the machine learning identified each one of these different clusters as places where they could be going. So each color represents a different, uh, different journey. If we zoom in on the starting point, you can see they didn't exactly start in the same spot. I mean, you've got those different colors are all over that general area. But it was still, the data science is still able to identify that this is the general starting point for everybody. And then if you zoom into any one of the end, end points, again, he's not exactly parking in the exact same parking spot every, every time. That's not practical. So it aggregates that and figures out that from that general starting point to this general finish point is a journey. And that's one of the options that we're going to predict against. With that in mind, we kick off an additional prediction. It's hard, or it's next to impossible for us to predict where you're going if you haven't gone anywhere yet. So when you start up the car initially in your driveway, we've got no context to where you're going other than a couple of very specific data points, specifically time and location. We can get relatively accurate with that based on human nature, right? If we look at a, the probability of you driving to work based on time in any given day, in the morning, it's pretty high that I'm going to be going to work. But as the time moves on during the day, I'm probably not going to go to work at 5 p.m., right? Same thing on the way home. I could be going home early, but at the 5 o'clock point, my likelihood of going home skyrockets. So it's these models that we use to generate that initial prediction. So where you are, what time is it? And then as we as we drive, we 
we uh, refine that prediction. So we loop through and we figure out, okay, now we have a general idea of where you're going or a more specific idea of where you're going. And so we fade out that initial prediction and replace it with the real-time prediction. The way that's represented is in the JSON is with this cluster. So we have predictions, cluster predictions, and the cluster predictions is an array of each potential journey. It's got an ID, it's got the let and longitude of the endpoint, the, so the destination, the miles per gallon for the journey, so in other words, how historically the miles per gallon for that, and then finally the probability, so how likely is this one to be the one. And as you can see, this is a, a median log loss uh, graph. As you can see, as you drive along, the accuracy, the lower the number here, the better. The accuracy improves. So as we have more context, the, be the more accurate the model becomes. Does that make sense? Once we can predict where you're going, then it's really just an extrapolation exercise, similar to what your car currently does uh, with regards to this journey is typically 25 miles per gallon times the number of gallons you have left in your tank, and that's your predicted range. Sitting on top of all of this, we've got the, our dashboard. So the real-time dashboard is uh, an HTML5 application. We use Gemfire as the data sor source to uh, serve that up. We do that specifically because it allows for the handling of uh, high rates of concurrent updates. Um, so in this case, when you're thinking of IoT solutions, you're probably, at least you're hopefully, going to have lots of different clients coming in wanting to update all at once. So the idea of being able to handle that quickly in memory is very useful. We're running it as the, uh, so the question was, are we using Gemfire standalone or as a service on Cloud Foundry? Uh, I showed earlier that both Redis and Gemfire are services on Cloud Foundry. Um, we're using REST to serve up the data to the uh, dashboard. Uh, we used Yaomin to generate the dashboard. It's a uh, front end framework for, for basically bootstrapping front end development. Um, and then it's an Angular JS application. It does. So that's, the question was, does it support multiple cars? Um, we'll get into a better use case of, or a better example of handling multiple cars in just a second. But for this specific example, um, there's this drop down. We only have one car in the system right now because it was just them. But you would select by VIN. And so the VIN would, I, would refresh both this map as well as the list of predictions, or list of potential journeys based on VIN. So this solution at scale, um, this is cute for a one car driving around Washington demo, but does this thing really scale? Is this really uh, something you can use in the real world? And the client we originally, the NDA client that we originally developed this for, um, they had hundreds of thousands of clients uh, worldwide or nationwide? Worldwide. Um, ingesting millions of messages a sec second that computed out to over 10 or 100 gigabyte per minute of data ingest. So this is a system that, that is running that's uh, very high volume. IoT issues. So obviously, if we're doing IoT uh, applications, we're going to run into issues. It's not all just a matter of throw up this code and everything just automatically works. Um, you're going to run into issues as you develop these IoT applications. The first one is compatibility. Um, OBD2 is a good example of that. The OBD2 is a standard, and I use that in the loosest possible term or reference of that term. Um, there's supposed to be a finite set of PIDs that you can access via a car. We've done this demo now probably 15, 20 times live. Every time we get a different car, we have to go through and make sure all the data is there. It works in the same way. Um, it's just each manufacturer implements it slightly differently and causes you to have you know, it's the equivalent of HTML hacking for in browsers, right? Each browser, you, had to, you have to tweak your HTML to work right for each browser. You have to do the same thing with each car for OBD2. Um, connectivity is obviously another big issue. Uh, most of the things in the IoT uh, that you're trying to connect to don't actually have connectivity. Uh, thermostats aren't normally connected, right? Cars normally aren't connected. So you typically have to add a radio of some kind or add connections of some kind to make those work. 
Security, in my opinion, is probably the biggest one, though. Um, if you've been following along in this space at all, specifically the connected car space, you've probably heard this past year the uh, Jeep uh, fiasco, if there's no better way to put it. Um, if you aren't familiar with the Jeep, uh, some security researchers this past year uh, illustrated that uh, the Jeep internet connection that it uses for essentially um, like concierge and those types of things, I think is what's the reason there's an internet connection at all. Um, you can actually take over control of the vehicle from anywhere on the internet with that connection. So whoever developed this originally didn't take the necessary precautions to actually secure the ability to, to talk to a car. Um, and actually there, that is something that uh, is both being um, made more aware of and it's also gonna make some IoT solutions harder. Um, a good example of that is the connected car. The, we can just plug into an OBD2 port right now with no problem and drive around a moving car. The OEMs are actually planning on making that a lot harder. They're making that access point a lot harder to get to because it secures it up a bit. Additional use cases. So we chose, yeah, question. For security, yep. So the question was, is how do we authenticate the ingest, on the ingest route? Okay. Sure. Um, so it really depends on your specific uh, use case. Um, in this example, if I were deploying this specific example in the production, I'd probably use certs. Um, so you'd have, you, you have to have some type of authentication. Um, and then there's obviously that enters into the whole cert management piece and whatnot, um, which there are solutions that, we're, that are available. But um, yeah, unfortunately, one, one of the, that goes directly as well to the compatibility aspect, right? Because each device is going to be talking to home differently. So um, I don't know if I answered the question or tap danced around it, but it's, yeah, I was saying any interesting question begins with it depends, or the answer to begins with depends. So the question was, is it any different than securing a regular HTTP request? In our example, it wouldn't be. Yeah, it would just be a matter, the, the actual, the hard piece of securing it wouldn't be so much securing the endpoint, but managing the authentication creds at, at, in the field. That would be the hard part of that problem. Yeah, so uh, the, the main solution for the, the Jeep use case specifically is don't allow inbound calls. Make it call out. That's the quick and dirty way to handle that problem. So additional use cases. What are some other use cases we could look at with that this type of architecture or even this specific app could be adapted to? One is quality feedback. When you think about it, when you buy a car, how much feedback of how the car is performing, how you're using it and whatnot, how much of that feedback gets back to the OEM? Not a lot. I mean, unless, you, unless you're going back to the dealer for every oil change and every you know, uh, bump and bruise you might get with it, they get very little feedback in the standard feedback loop of a car. Tesla has flipped this on its head. Tesla, every time you plug in the charger, does a data dump. They take all kinds of data, real time, real car usage data. So they have mountains of data. So the other OEMs are actually looking to catch up on this. And this is one of the examples of things that we're working with uh, current clients working on is being able to implement this type of thing and improve this type of communication uh, with real OEMs. The next one is fleet management. This is, uh, I'm, this is based on the uh, work that actually Derek did. So I'm gonna invite him up uh, to talk a little bit about this. This is the app that served as the inspiration for last night and tonight's keynote. So if you're interested at all in what, where that came about and whatnot, this is the app that that came from. Can I give it to you? Thanks. Uh, good point. I have a loud voice, but uh, record. All right, thanks for that, Michael. Um, so while I'm getting this thing on, how many people uh, did see the keynote last night? Okay, good range of hands. Everyone can hear me okay? Um, yeah, so good segue, that question earlier. What do you do if uh, you want to look at more than just one car? And even, even this um, UI showed the ability to have a drop down and look at 
you know, switching to other cars. But that's a different kind of question. That allows me to context switch. You know? So this, this demo was all about, um, I'm going to go very granular. I want a real-time view of exactly what's going on with my vehicle, right? Um, but when we start talking about aggregating, we have all sorts of different questions. Uh, Michael, I just, uh, f how do I flip over to your browser? I want to go to the, okay, good. Uh, right, there we go, okay, great. Okay, screen real estate's a little tight here. <laughs> okay, so um, when we start stepping back a bit, um, we now are talking about fleet management type problems, right? Um, same kinds of data we're collecting but a whole different range of questions and a whole different range of things we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, one of the things you want to do, and, and in fact, what this was, the, for the particular client that this was done for, it really centered around this concept of real-time roadside assistance. Um, why would I want to do that? Well, uh, number one, if I have a, a vehicle in my fleet that um, dies for whatever reason, if that vehicle's sitting on the road not doing anything, I'm losing money, right? But more importantly, um, if the vehicle's dead for um, a particular reason that uh, maybe, you know, I let it run when it shouldn't have, I should have been more proactive about it, I'd really like to know exactly what kind of problems I'm having with the engine because I might want to intervene before something catastrophic happens, right? Because we all know an uh, ounce of, uh, what is it, an ounce of cure, pound of... Uh, Someone help me out. Yeah, and something. You know, you you uh, you go ahead and you solve the problem before the the real nasty problem happens, right? Um, so this concept of having the ability to say, tell me what's really going on with the fleet, tell me what type of um, you know real time predictive analytics I can do, not around where the the vehicle's going, but around when is it going to fail? Um, because if I can sense that ahead of time then I can stave off something, um, you know, something much, much worse, right? So to that in mind, uh, for those of you who saw the, well, not everything's perfect, right? I'll take the blame for that one. Um, for everyone who saw the keynote uh, last night, it was based on something that looks like this. Um, this was actually the POC that was developed. Here, we're looking at uh, an aggregate view of all the vehicles uh, that we have. And, and this is live, by the way. This is, we're looking at live vehicles here. So if I uh, come down to where we are, I've got this nice ability to kind of fence and dynamically cluster my data. Let's come on down to DC here. And let's continue to zoom in on where we are and see if we can find anything interesting going on in DC. Well, there's two that we have here. And of course my screen real estate isn't cooperating with me. Michael, any uh, magic ideas how I can... Uh... I, what I'm trying to show you, there's a uh, detailed information panel and it's much nicer. There we go. At least you can kind of get the idea. Um, if you can see the detailed information panel. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So in this case, I'm not so much concerned about the real time, um, turn by turn, and where are they going. I'm more interested in, okay, give me the basics around um, what's going on with that particular uh, truck. Where is it? But also, I'm interested in fault codes. Uh, what kind of fault information do I have? Um, the idea being that then if I can take the, those fault codes and if I add my smarts as a truck management fleet, um, I can do some interesting interpretive analysis on, um, gee, what is likely the problem with that truck? What's likely the fix? What's likely the fix uh, cost now? versus if I wait a week, right? So we're taking that same kind of predictive analytics, but we're flipping it to do something um, that is, you know, if we, if we take Michael's approach of, you know, 1%, we're now saving millions and millions of dollars, right? So in this particular case, um, and what you saw last night on the keynote, and what you'll see tonight too, is it's actually focusing around the ability to 
to do predictive analytics on the fault, but also to manage it from a fleet-wide standpoint. And of course, the natural segue is to say, great, now if I'm able to see this as a fleet, you know, if I want to, if you know, maybe I want to filter on, um, show me, you know, anybody that's currently in motion, um, and we'll zoom out so we actually get some data here. And, you know, and then in theory, um, not only do I have vehicles who are in motion, here's somebody that's in motion at 23 miles per hour, but then if I can actually uh, combine that with looking at, you know, you see the legends down here, um, let me see vehicles that are moving that are in a serious crisis of a fault code. Well, those vehicles that are in the most severe crisis, they should not be moving. Um, they should be pulled over immediately. So in that case, let's be really proactive. Let's call them up. Let's, let's contact the, the company that owns that particular um, fleet, that particular unit. Let's have them call the driver and say, pull over now. Um, and then and what they were talking about last night with the service center ability is here, is then once you pull the vehicle over, let's find the nearest service center that's in our laundry list of service centers and let's work out a way to get a truck over to pick them up or if we think we can have them drive to the service center, great, we'll have them drive to the service center. And by the way, let's look at what vehicles are available at the service center that we can swap out now, right? So now we're avoiding the problem altogether. This is the kind of stuff that, you know, that the companies are really looking at for fleet management, is getting in ahead of the problem and actually predicting where we're gonna see something and stopping it before it does, swapping the vehicles out so that you don't really have the issues, right? So the interesting thing is, and I'll flip now back over to the slide here, is when we were approached to do this um, POC uh, by this firm, um, they, uh, they had made the comment that uh, it took them, they, they had worked on it for 18 months. Now I'm gonna get to the, the architecture of how we did this. They had worked on it for 18 months and they still didn't have anything to show. So um, I led a team of uh, folks to go ahead and say, well, we'll go ahead and do this POC for you. Um, now, lead's a loose word. It was a team of two. Um, and in four weeks, we spit out this demo with live alerts, showing them when there were severe truck issues. And um, it, was, it was highly uh, well received. That wasn't a testament to myself and the other engineer. Uh, we're, we're good. Uh, lots of people are good. It was a testament to the platform that we used. Um, now. There's a caveat there. We were able to dump all of the baggage that this big company has, right? Because they had the requirements of, okay, we have our IT guys and they have these, you know, predefined um, application servers that you have to use and you have to use this hardware. And we said, well, we can do whatever we want, right? And of course, what we did is we used Cloud Foundry um, and these tools here. You might look at this, this architecture and go, well, wow, um, this is the architecture that Michael just described for connected car. And Michael and Phil and I hadn't even collaborated. I had no idea how they did their thing. They had no idea how I did my thing. Um, but of course, we ended up using a lot of the same tools, a lot of the same reasons. Um, Spring XD, here is a very different reason why we're using Spring XD. With fleet management, um, you don't take a dongle and you don't plug it into every truck you have. Um, they don't want to rely on drivers to actually send telemetry data. They really want to kind of know that that telemetry data is there no matter what. And in fact, a lot of uh, truck manufacturers build transponders into the vehicles. However, like the dongles, they're all different. They all speak different languages. They all speak different protocols. Um, so if you were to go and want to manage your fleet without something like this, you then end up uh, plugging yourself into about 40 different websites. What do you do? You look up the VIN of the truck, you take that, you look up in your records, you go, what kind of engine is it? What make, what model, what year? Okay, that particular sequence of things is handled by this particular telemetry provider. Let me go log into that website of that telemetry provider and find out what's going on. And this is literally what they did. They had 40 different websites. And of course, telemetry provider programmers, well, they're like database programmers designing websites. You know, no, nothing, no knocks against database designers, but what you get is you get a web view of something that looks like a spreadsheet, right? Not terribly intuitive, not, not very uh, useful. So this was the problem they had. And the question was, was well, can we create a single point of view, a sing single system of record? Well, sure we can. 
all we need is we need some kind of an engine that can ingest uh, data from many, many different protocols, many, many different sites, and then pump that into one source. Well, that's exactly what Spring XD did in this case. So instead of, in the case of the connected car, uh, being a simple way to pump HTTP data from, from a dongle uh, through a phone, instead this was a way for us to aggregate many different types of, of uh, sources of information. Um, some of them were RESTful, some of them were XML, some of them were JSON, some of them were pulled, some of them were pushed. Um, no problem, Spring XD makes it really easy to do this. So here we're funneling 40 different um, data sources into one repository. We pump that same information into Gemfire for the same reason that Connected Car does, because we want it to be responsive, we want to know it can grow and scale out, but we also want to know that when we move to being super proactive, hyper proactive, that means an asynchronous model, event driven. Gemfire is a fantastic choice for event driven stuff. Um, we, we pump that same data into our analytic uh, warehouse. In this case, we used Greenplum, could have used Hawk, could have used Spark, could have used any number of things. Uh, the nice thing about that was you have Gemfire driving the real time display, but then you have the analytic they're driving your BI. So when the customer comes and says, hey, I want to do uh, some analytics, Great, you can tap into the single system of record. Is that a question? Yeah, so you mentioned that the tool first being resilient That's something that's actually handled by the telemetry provider. Um, okay. What's that? Oh, repeat the question, sure. Uh, so the question is, um, is if they provide, if some of these manufacturers provide the, the telemetry transponders in the trucks, how does it actually get connected to the telemetry provider or to us? Um, so that's the, the challenge around having this as one uh, source versus many sources. It turns out that different telemetry providers, um, they have contracts uh, with the different transponders and the different vehicle manufacturers. So it all depends on whatever contract the vehicle manufacturer um, created with that particular transponder. And some of them are third party transponders and some of them are built right into the engine. Sometimes you have both. So sometimes you actually have vehicles which are talking to two different telemetry providers. But that's a contract that's totally up to those dedicated telemetry providers. And these guys are data providers. So you have essentially intermediaries that are handling all that radio information and then they're presenting it into their own version of a website. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just think that they Well, so, and so like anything else, um, it depends. Well, in this case, it depends on the telemetry provider. Um, some telemetry providers, uh, they are doing the right things. Um, you know, they're highly authenticated, they're encrypted. Other ones, especially the older ones, not so secure. Um, so to some extent, you're only as secure as the weakest link in this case. So yeah, you're right. Um, you'd have to be concerned about what they're doing to secure the transponder to the point of collection. But the one thing that makes this a little bit different is, is that this is, um, uh, this is a read-only, and it's a contract that's already provided, uh, you know, through inventory between the vehicle and the and the telemetry provider collector. Um, so it's not like a dongle that I can just go add. You know, I have to have the ability to actually um, register a VIN and have that VIN tied to a particular ID. What really happens uh, at the transponder level is each transponder has an ID tied to a VIN, and they register that. In this case, the customer knows what VINs they have. Um, and so it's a bin lookup. But yeah, obviously there, that's a point of exploit. Um, and that's something that you have to, you have to look towards industry trying to provide um, better security standards around how they're gonna secure the entire path. In this case, we can only secure the path from data collection. Um, and, and for most of the telemetry providers, it's simple um, HTTPS authentication. Um, but obviously there's a deeper concern around how you, how you secure the back end portion. Right, right, and like anything, it's, um, you know, you'd like to think you deal with all this stuff up front, but it tends to be compromises. What you do is you present them with a better tool. Um, the better tool makes them want to move forward. That exposes the flaws, and then they go back and they patch up the flaws, and unfortunately, security is always a uh, second thought. It, it's, 
just the nature of the beast. But, um, but yeah, those are concerns that are actually being addressed. But they're also being moved forward by these kinds of technologies because these kinds of technologies are exposing um, how serious these flaws are. I mean, we've seen uh, the problems with, like it was Jeep that, uh, you know, there was the hack that, you know, you could hack and actually uh, control the car and this doesn't make for good press. Well, the reality is, is these problems are going to be solved until someone tries to break it and now everyone becomes aware and now it becomes an industry-wide awareness, right? So, um, so I'm, I'm going to wrap up here, um, but the point is, is this, this same platform, you know, was, uh, enabled us to uh, build a completely different product, you know, for the similar reasons and, and at the end, we were able to take work uh, you know, that had stagnated over the course of a year and a half and leveraging, you know, really best of breed scalable products. And everything we built here, even though it was a POC, was already production grade, production scalable ready, every component horizontally scalable. And that was a testament to the, uh, the products that we used, the platforms that we used. Um, and it's the idea of being able to really accelerate, um, accelerate what you're able to accomplish. And with tools like Spring XD, Gemfire, I mean, it really dramatically improves what you can do around IoT. And you can see, of course, the, the possibilities are endless with this. Any other questions? All right, thank you, everyone. Turn it back over to Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. So when we think about connected car and the, the, the use cases, there's really uh, three that we typically iterate through. It's OEMs, it's fl fleet management of some kind, and then it's insurance of some kind. And this last one, uh, I wanna play a little video that illustrates uh, what, what could be done on the, video, on the insurance side of things. No, 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 it's just, it's just construction, yeah, that's all. No, 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 I'm, I, I'm not driving. Are you okay? Yeah, you? I'm good, I'm good. Go oh, no, not you. Listen, I'm gonna have to call my agent. Mr. I'm gonna Burton? get right back to you. Mr. Burton, this is InsureCorp. We've received sensor data that indicates you were in an accident. Are you injured in any way? I'm not injured, no. Is anyone else injured? I don't believe so. Okay, where's my agent's number? We have pinpointed your location and we are showing your car is not drivable. So we are dispatching an Uber car to take you to your destination. That would be great. I'm pressing one. English. E-N-G-L-I, English. May we give your coordinates to our appraiser drone to perform the appraisal? Absolutely. We have received the photos, assessed the damage, authorized the repair, selected a qualified repair facility, and have dispatched a tow truck to take your vehicle to that facility. Perfect. Yes, hi, this is... Yes, I'll hold. We have looked up the other vehicle's insurance, transmitted the appropriate data to create the claim, and filed the California SR1 accident report. Can you confirm the information is correct on your phone, then hit the accept button? Uh, I'll check it right now. Okay, all done. Thank you. Your Uber car is arriving now. Ah, I see it coming. Accident, not payment, accident. Your tow truck should be there now. Don't forget to leave your keys in the vehicle. Thank you for using InsureCorp, powered by Pivotal Labs. So, while funny, um, I would hope that you can realize that the jump from what we just did live today to that really isn't that far. We're actually already working with OE, so with the three use cases, we're working with OEMs to improve data uh, feedback. We're working with, as you saw, fleet management companies to manage fleets, and we are working with insurance companies to implement most of that stuff. The insurance company in question even does use a drone for different things. <laughs> um, but so, as you can see, this, this same thing can be applied to a number of different use cases. 
And so in conclusion, uh, IoT obviously presents a number of different challenges, data management, uh, data collection, security, so forth. Um, but if you can bridge the gaps, if you can get the data, we like to think Spring Cloud and the Spring Platform uh, help make things a whole lot easier. With that, questions? Thank you, everybody.